As a young naturalist, uh, Robert Bateman could sometimes be found with dead mice in his pockets. I mean, while other kids had pet goldfish, he was raising wild owls. Mm -hmm. I know. The whole world was his teacher. And there are a lot of things that you might not know about him, but if you have looked into his paintings, into his photography, read any of his books, or heard him speak, one thing you cannot miss about Robert Bateman is he's truly in love with the world. And he has spent his entire life protecting it and speaking for those who don't have a human voice. It's such a privilege and an honor to have him as our friend at Royal Roads and to have him here today to speak with you about the future that you want to see. Terry Tempest Williams says, the eyes of the future are looking back at us and they're praying for us to see beyond our time. Well, Bob Bateman is exactly the kind of person who wakes us up and asks us to stay awake and look beyond our time, to think beyond our time, so that there is a future for the generations ahead of us to inherit, so that we can find a sustainable and diverse way of living. The eyes of the future are looking back at us and they're praying for us to see beyond our own time. This is a beautiful chance today for you to participate and to take up your obligation as Earth citizens. And there's no one better to start this day off than our Earth elder and our keynote for the morning, Robert Bateman. It's my new thing. First of all, I would like to apologize for wearing a jacket. I think I'm the only guy here with a jacket on. Uh, my wife said I had to dress up. And my wife's way smarter, smarter than I am. And I'm always uh, quite obedient. And so that's why I'm wearing, wearing this jacket. It might come off a bit later in the day. Um, and I would like to say I know that this is a room full of wonderful human beings. I love what Rick said uh, a few minutes ago, that you are all teachers, whether you know it or not. Uh, what Hillary didn't say, I was a high school teacher while I'm coming to this for, uh, for 20 years, until I was making more money on my painting than I was on my teaching, and I figured somebody up there, like Revenue Canada, was trying to tell me something. And so I went into painting full time at the age of 45, I think I was. I didn't sell a painting until I was 35. And, and so I've always been, uh, interested and in, involved with kids and, and uh, young people, and I'm honored that you're here today, and I'm especially honored that my member of parliament is here today, Elizabeth May. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have heard her speak. I never, I, I try to never miss uh, an opportunity, and I'll, I'll, I think I'll refer to her uh, once uh, or twice when, when I get going. I'm not gonna talk about art. Um, I think uh, I do talk about art a lot, but not this morning. I think that uh, everybody in the world is not meant to be artists, uh, just like everybody in the world is not meant to be uh, pianists, uh, you know, piano players or hockey players. But I think everybody in the world is meant to be a naturalist. But unfortunately, there are very few, and they're getting to be fewer, especially among young people. And I'll, I'll refer to that a little bit uh, more as, as we go along as well. Oh, before I start, I meant to thank uh, Greg Sam and his group, who probably left, uh, for the blessing. Uh, we have a lot to, uh, first of all, apologize for, uh, for our First Nations, to our First Nations people, but we have an awful lot to learn from our First Nations people, and we should be paying attention to them. And um, they have made it uh, very clear that we are on one of their sacred places here. There are places in the forest here that uh, even Royal Road staff are not allowed to visit. They're so special. Only special First Nations families uh, can visit. And so it's a great uh, privilege for Royal Road University to be here. I think, uh, uh, I think I, I cannot, I've never been contradicted when I say that I think that uh, Royal Roads is the most beautiful campus in the world. And uh, I, I, the reason for it is because it's full of natural heritage and full of human heritage. And both of those things are, are the things that I actually worship the most about the planet Earth and have been spending oh, 40 or 50 years ranting about how this natural heritage and human heritage is disappearing. But I'm not going to really especially talk about that this morning. And I'm not going to talk about uh, climate change or global warming. 
or pollution. I'll let uh, Suzuki and Al Gore and, and more capable people talk about that. I'm going to talk about um, nature and human nature and trying to figure out the reason why we are where we are. Now, I think I have a laser pointer, although I may not need it. Oh, can we have the lights off? My, my pictures need all the help they can get. That, that's a little bit better. Uh, uh, this is um, uh, a picture uh, taken on a canoe trip in the Ogoki Albany Wilderness area uh, in northern Ontario. Bruce Heyer, this guy in the stern of the canoe, uh, was a very forceful American environmentalist, but he got sick of America and left and moved to Canada, up into northern Ontario, became an outfitter and an avid environmentalist. And uh, Elizabeth will probably know, I believe he's still a, he is now an NDP um, member of parliament. Okay, he's an independent, and I imagine you have admiration for Bruce, uh, as do I. Well, before he even dreamed of doing that, he was trying to save a chunk of Ontario wilderness where the, the best herd of woodland caribou were in Ontario. And he thought, since I was a kind of a little bit of a, a name or celebrity, he'd invite me to go on a canoe trip there, and then I'd get interviewed by the media and raise consciousness of it. And so I did go on this uh, canoe trip, and... Um, he, uh, of course, I got interviewed by the media, but they wouldn't ask me why I was there. They just kept throwing these softball questions to me. Well, uh, were your parents interested in art too? And do you have any children who like to do art? But I'm here because of the, the, the logging is threatening. <laughs> um, and um, how long have you been an artist? And just all these <laughs> annoyingly softball, meaningless questions. They did not want to know why I was there. And of course, nothing got published by that. Uh, so I often uh, show this slide and I, I make the statement, where we are now in society, it's like we're in a canoe in rapids. We have a choice to steer or not steer, but we do not have the choice to get out of the canoe. And we're whipping along really, really rapidly. Uh, things are changing not only year by year, but month by month in our society. And changes are happening so fast. And I don't hear anybody steering. Even though I'm not a politician, and I never would be a politician, my wife would divorce me, she said, if I ever considered entering politics. Um, and I'm not going to associate myself with any uh, party, but I guess people pretty well guess uh, whose side I'm on. Uh, I, um, I'm a political junkie. I just love paying attention to politics, especially American politics. It, it's, I, I watch it with amusement and horror, like watching sharks feeding. Uh, and it's getting that way in Canada, too, I must say. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to say, I think the best politician, certainly, that I've ever heard of is Elizabeth May, and maybe the best politician in Canadian history. I, uh, I, can't, I, I can't think of a better one. <laughs> um, and, and uh, if, if you can think of a better one, tell me. If you can think of a better campus uh, than this one, tell me, a more beautiful campus. And if you think anything I'm saying during my talk, by the way, I plan to make uh, quite a number of you mad while I'm going along, uh, then come up and tell me where I'm wrong. I've been giving talks something like this since the 1960s, and I keep urging people, to, because actually I'm praying that I'm wrong. And so far, nobody's told me that I'm wrong. Uh, except the president of the Plastics Manufacturers Association of, of Ontario. But his wife said I was right and he was full of baloney. Um, so anyway, here I am uh, in, in a canoe with, with uh, uh, not Bill, that, 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 Bruce Heyer, Bruce Heyer. I'm in the bow and uh, the guy, uh, that's me in case you don't recognize me. Um, uh, the guy, and I'm scared out of my wits also, in case you can tell by the expression on my face. Uh, the guy in the bow has the um, ability to turn the canoe faster than the one in the stern. The stern is the boss. So he kept yelling at me, draw right, draw right, draw right, draw left, draw. You, you draw, you pull the paddle in, you draw, and that turns the bow. Draw left, draw left, draw right, draw right, draw left, draw left. After the canoe tri trip, he was telling everybody he took Bateman on a canoe trip and Bateman couldn't draw worth a damn. But he taught me how to draw. He's absolutely right. Uh, now this is going to be kind of a theme running through the, the talk. Uh, Eric mentioned that uh, 
it wasn't technology that was important, it was uh, attitude. And this is one of my favorite quotes from E.F. Schumacher who wrote, Small is Beautiful. The real problems of our planet are not economic and they're not technical. They are philosophical. The philosophy of unbridled materialism is now being challenged by events. Um, do you think that that's an appropriate description of our philosophy, of our society? Unbridled materialism? Again, I've been searching for a better one and no one has given me a better suggestion for what our philosophy is. That's, that's what runs our society. Unbridled materialism. More stuff, the better. Uh, but it's now being challenged by events. These events speak to us in a language of breakdown, unemployment, pollution, and exhaustion. Ever bigger machines entailing ever bigger concentrations of economic power and exerting ever greater violence against the environment do not represent progress. You used to hear people say, well, you can't stop progress. And uh, I think we need to get a new definition of progress. You don't hear people saying that much anymore. They are a denial of wisdom. Wisdom demands a new orientation of science and technology toward the organic, the gentle, the nonviolent, the elegant, and the beautiful. And this is a, a, a metaphor for what we've been doing with nature, especially in the, in the 20th century. Uh, these are um, a bunch of Newfoundlanders uh, bringing in a, a codfish. And uh, probably all, all the kids in the room would, would Remember, would, would not remember a historic thing happened that the cod fishery was closed because there wasn't enough codfish. Elizabeth will know the year I've forgotten. It shut down in 1989. 1989. I don't know how old you were in 1989, but that's when it was shut down. And uh, <clears throat> completely closed. And the scientists kept warning about it. And uh, I remember I listen to CBC all day uh, while I'm painting, and that partly explains the way my brain is, I guess. Um, I remember hearing uh, the day after they closed the cod fishery, they interviewed a Newfoundland uh, cod fisherman, and they said, well, how do you feel about this? And he said, well, you might, as, you might as well cut off my right arm. But he said, the real problem is I've just taken delivery on a $1 million boat, and I don't know how I'm going to pay for it. Well, my question is, what is a Newfoundland fisherman doing with a $1 million boat in the first place, with all that advanced technology to catch every last codfish? And the reason they have to catch those codfish is to pay the interest on the loan of those $1 million boats. And, they're, and that's not the only $1 million boat. They're all out there and they're all trying to, trying to pay off the loans on, the, on that idiotic technology. We've got to get our brains and our common sense catching up with our technology. The word greed has been used once or twice today and that certainly is a natural human emotion but we need to control it. If we're still catching cod like this, there would be abundant cod and there'd be all kinds of little fishing villages and outports. But now it's commercially finished. This is one of my, I think it's one of my most important paintings. It's a painting, a view in a drift net. Um, and it's a, a very tragic painting. Uh, it's a, um, a Pacific white-sided dolphin in a Lysan, Lysan albatross uh, caught in a drift net. Incidentally, I actually got a real chunk of drift net from the uh, uh, Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Nanaimo and, and stuck it on the front of the canvas. Uh, so you can actually go up if a guard will let you if it's in a gallery and go snap, snap and, and pluck the drift net. And then it's sort of a fool the eye looking at these creatures in the drift net. And these are just unfortunate casualties of commercial fishing, of industrial fishing. They're known in the industry as bycatch. That's a euphemism for wildlife that's been murdered and dumped over in the ocean as garbage. One million birds die this way every year and are dumped as garbage. One million mammals of porpoises and whales and dolphins and so on are dumped over as garbage to sea turtles. Countless millions, probably billions of fish that are not commercial are caught and are dumped over as garbage as well. And uh, this is, <laughs> the oceans are probably one of the, the the parts of the world that we don't notice, we just we can see it, you know, from Royal Roads here, we can see the ocean, but what's going on beneath the surface, we don't know, and it ain't pretty. Um, Woody Allen was asked one time to describe nature. He said, well, nature is basically one big restaurant, but what Woody Allen did not say was, nature is a free lunch. There is no free lunch. There is no free lunch. And you can pay now, or you can pay later. But if you pay later, it's going to cost more. It always does, whether you buy a car, buy a house, whatever you buy, or protect nature. 
we can protect it now, which is going to cost money, or protect it later, but it'll cost a lot more. And we seem to be saying, as in our generation, well, we don't want to pay now. We actually would rather pay later. And that means, I heard an older woman say, that means we're going to have our grandchildren pay. That means what we're doing now is grandchild abuse because it's going to get very expensive to clean things up nature it's, uh, later, clean up nature later. Oh, I, um, here's a, uh, I, I talked to a Newfoundland fisherman once about bycatch. Oh, uh, the, the question of bycatch in shrimp is um, uh, one kilo of shrimp commercially caught yields seven kilos of bycatch. So if you eat commercial shrimp, then you're part of the problem of creating seven kilos of bycatch, just garbage that's been dumped over and wasted. Is this necessary? No, it's not necessary. I spoke to a Newfoundland shrimp fisherman, and he said he has no bycatch because he's got these stainless steel traps that steer away all of the um, small fish and, uh, under, and, and big fish and undersized shrimp, and he gets 100% commercial catch. But the trouble is, he says, it costs $5,000 a month to refurbish the stainless steel. Um, so I have two rhetorical questions. If every shrimp fisherman was compelled to do this, would it raise the price of shrimp? Yes, the, uh, the answer is yes. These are rhetorical questions, so you don't have to answer. Uh, the second question is, is it worth it? Would it be worth it to pay a few more pennies for our shrimp if it meant we had no bycatch? Would it be worth it to pay a few more pennies for our energy if it, if it meant we could have a good future for the planet and pay a few more f pennies for organic food, pay a few more pennies for everything, we could have a beautiful future, but there's no free lunch. And that's what people are not waking up to happening. I've been hearing nothing but rants on the radio all morning this morning about the price of gas going up. The price of gas has to double, quadruple, and even more if we're going to have a sustainable future. Uh, this is, uh, is a copy of one of my paintings. The actual painting is cut off about there, and that's a pelican diving. But I, I reconfigured it and have it di had it diving into an oil spill. And I did this at the time of the great Gulf oil spill with the BP and Exxon, uh, and well, especially BP and Chevron, in the Gulf of Mexico, that you all remember. And I did it as a, uh, a YouTube thing, but I haven't posted it yet, and maybe I won't get around to it, I don't know. Uh, and the, the lettering says pelicans plus egrets, gulls, cormorants, migratory birds, shrimp, oyster, fish, and people's livelihoods going down. Not a pretty picture. We urgently need tough regulations with budgets and regulators with backbones. Shortcuts are too expensive. We're doing shortcuts all over the place, but it's going to cost us a lot of money. If not now, it'll be costing us a lot of money in the future. Uh, here's a little, uh, just a little case example. Um, it's a picture in Spain. It's in La Mancha. And uh, some of you, uh, certainly the adults will know there's a musical called The Man from La Mancha. That's Don Quixote, the, uh, the famous uh, guy that tilted at windmills, um, one of the most famous books in Spanish literature. So it's very godforsaken country. It's, it's arid and there's a terrible climate, uh, too cold in the winter, too hot in the summer. And so it's uh, kind of poverty stricken. Um, and so the EU, that's uh, Brussels, that's the European Union, decided to give uh, a whole bunch of money to subsidize grape growing. Well, uh, grapes are growing all over the Mediterranean and have been there for 2,000 years where nature says it's a good idea to grow grapes. It's not a good idea to grow grapes here, but um, we have the technology and we got the cash, and so we take taxpayers' money and sink millions of dollars into irrigation so we can grow grapes there. That would help out the poor folks of La Mancha. Well, uh, this monkeying around nature has unintended consequences. By the way, th that's the way the grapes grow there. Those are quite old grapevines, <laughs> and they're only about knee high. So uh, there they are, happily growing, and the way they've got the water is they, well, we can dig very, very deep wells now and get down to the deep aquifer and pump out the water. Well, once again, no free lunch. All the farms around had shallow wells. 
So you pump out the aquifer from deep wells and all the farm's wells went dry. So all the farmers gave up and abandoned and went to the slums of Madrid and other places in Mexico. So the farming and the local uh, livelihoods of the people has been ruined. And not only that, there's a Ramsar site, a significant United Nations wetland down in here. They also pumped the water out of that and, the water, and that went dry and a lot of endangered birds were threatened. Well, it was against the law to do that, but the, they don't have regulators with backbones. And there are easy ways of getting around laws, which, are, which happens in Canada all the time, as Elizabeth could tell you. Uh, there, there are crimes being created by the thousands all across Canada, and those crimes are not being cr prosecuted. Uh, so, uh, so that's the, the farms have gone belly up, and uh, the wetlands gone dry. However, we got the wine. Well, there's a surplus of wine in Europe. They don't need the wine. And so instead of storing the wine, they've turned it into commercial alcohol. But there's also a surplus of commercial alcohol, but they're storing it at taxpayers' expense and still going on with this insanity. They've ruined the livelihoods, they've ruined nature, they've ruined the wetlands, and it's cost the taxpayers millions of dollars. Does this happen in Canada? Where we subsidize to have all these great projects? I think maybe Elizabeth will tell you. I think so. <laughs> And uh, we have to pay attention to these things. So uh, how did we get here? This is a short history of uh, human beings. We'll start with Paleolithic. And uh, this, uh, besides my own art, this is some of the few art pieces you'll see. Uh, human beings actually started out, and, and for hundreds of thousands of years, every human being was an avid naturalist and paid attention. Every little clue about nature mattered, and they could read nature way more than the most profound biology professor can do it now. Uh, and they went on that way for hundreds of thousands of years until along came a great revolution called the Neolithic Revolution, which was the beginning of agriculture, which was around, uh, I guess, 3,000, 4,000 years ago in Syria and, and Egypt, uh, Assyria and Egypt and Sumeria, places like that. And we found we could uh, um, tame nature and actually plant seeds, and we didn't have to wander all, all over the place gathering each individual seed or fruit or whatever it was. And then that meant we didn't have to be nomadic and we could live in little groups and, and then immediately get a whole bunch of problems. You have to get chiefs, you have to get government, you have to get rules and regulations and so on. And here we are today. Uh, and agriculture has gone uh, pretty, pretty far. In fact, I think it's gone too far, and it's got into this, what you might call, agribusiness. And now we have uh, Franken foods with uh, uh, all kinds of uh, genetic uh, variations. We've got huge chemical corporations producing poisons that uh, kill all other plants but don't kill their product. They, as you probably know, I'm not mentioning any names, <laughs> but Elizabeth could. Uh, they've invented seeds that commit suicide, so you can't do as people have done all of human history, harvest the crop and save some seeds and plant them, uh-uh. You have to buy their seeds again next year. And, and so uh, I think the time has come, whoops, how do I go back? Uh, yeah, when we, uh, this is one of my cartoons, or one of my drawings, uh, time has come to, uh, to say when. Um, I think we've gone about as far as we need to go in a whole lot of areas and we ought to stop and take a breath and figure out, uh, do we want to keep on going, it, rushing along in this rapids in our canoe as fast as we're going without paying attention? Oh, by the way, uh, I meant to get a little bit political there. I, in paying attention to, to politicians, as I say I do, uh, during the last elections in Canada, and certainly the ones in the States, and certainly if you listen to Republicans, the main message I'm getting from a lot of the politicians of certain parties is, vote for me, I will cut your taxes, and then that'll put more money in your own pocket, and therefore you can go to the mall and buy stuff. And everybody will live happily ever after. In other words, we will have salvation through shopping, or salvation through selfishness. Now that's a Christian message if I ever heard one. That seems to be the main message from the politicians. And uh, I think they have to wake up and realize that if we want a good future, we're gonna to have to actually pay for it. And uh, so, so many, uh, I mean, uh, it's great to have um, a cup of coffee, but do you want the coffee to go all over your arm and down the table? 
or cocoa or whatever it is. It's great to put a little bit of sugar in your coffee, but do you want, do you want to put half a pound of sugar in your coffee? Um, there is such a thing as limits, and we have to start paying attention to them and thinking about them. Uh, okay, I got the way I am. Um, I, just, I had my, uh, actually my 82nd birthday was yesterday, and uh, I was born on the 24th of May, so I know it's the 25th today. I, I can remember that much, I was, uh, which is the same day as Queen Victoria. I was born on the same month and day as Queen Victoria, but I was born in a different year than Queen Victoria, believe it or not. Uh, and so I was, uh, uh, I was 15 when World War II ended, and I watched the post-World War II boom happen because I was kind of a conscious teenager like you are. And in my 20s, I saw the 1950s boom. This is my cartoon of the 1950s attitude. And those of you that were, uh, it's probably nobody as ancient as I am, certainly in this room, uh, who paid attention to the 50s, it was so optimistic. It was really a building boom time and all kinds of inventiveness, and we had peace. And um, so I have these young guys who um, are wearing rose-colored glasses, thinking that, that we're going to have a rosy future, and all we have to do is go onward and upward on the yellow brick road, uh, making as much money and going as fast as possible in our great big 50s um, convertible, spewing out as much exhaust as possible, and not caring about tomorrow. And so we were zooming onwards and upwards, thinking of this wonderful glorious, glowing future. These are uh, images that people were talking about in the 60s and maybe even the 70s. This is going to be what it's like now in the 21st century. <sighs> Instead, this is what it's like now in the 21st century. It's gridlock and pr pollution and problems that people can't. <sighs> Have you ever driven around uh, Vancouver during rush hour? And it seems to be getting worse? And nobody seems to be talking any kind of common sense about what we're doing and saying when. And so we're into um, gridlock and jam ups and we keep piling more and more of the same old thing on. And um, as Einstein said, you can't solve the problems of, of today by keeping on doing the same thing over and over. It's kind of a definition of insanity. And it's probably going to get worse. Uh, America and Canada as well are in a horrendous state of disrepair of infrastructure, of railroads and bridges and foundations of buildings even and public buildings and all kinds of public works are being cheated all the time and we're not doing anything about it. So we're actually going downhill. We're not going to let glorious world of the future that we thought. It, I think it's, that's kind of over. I think we need a new vision, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, this is uh, one of my paintings called Cardinal and Wild Apples and it's um, based on a song by Joni Mitchell. Uh, certainly the older folks in the room will know Joni Mitchell, and maybe, I just, I'm, I'm actually curious, would everybody in the room who's heard of Joni M Mitchell put up your hand? Yeah. Great, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, my kids, uh, you know, my oldest kid is in his 40s, well, three of my oldest kids are in their 40s, and my younger kids uh, were born after the Beatles were over, and the Beatles are some of their favorite musicians, and you guys are probably familiar with the Beatles too. Well, the, the song is The Big Yellow Taxi, and it goes, uh, take all the trees and you put them in a tree museum, and you charge all the people a dollar and a half just to see them. Don't it always seem to go? You don't know what you've got till it's gone. You pave paradise and you put up a parking lot. That could be my theme song. And this song is, say to the farmer, put away your DDT now. Give me spots on apples, but save me the birds and the bees. Don't it always seem to go, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, I have uh, another rhetorical question. Would you buy apples with spots on them and maybe even pay more if it meant we didn't have to spray poisons all over our crops? If your answer is no, I have news for you. Apple spot won't hurt you. You, you shut your eyes and you don't even know you're eating apple spot. In fact, my grandmother ate apples with spots on them all her life and she did not die from apple spot. There's never been a death from apple spot, to my knowledge. I, w I was once honored to be the keynote speaker at, a, at the uh, annual meeting of the Society of Environmental Toxicologists. And these are these big chemical companies. They have environmental divisions. Thank goodness, practically all of them are getting slightly better. They need to go faster, but they are improving. And so these are smart guys. And I asked them a question I didn't know the answer to. I said, in the 50 years we've been spraying poisons all over our crops, 
since the end of World War II. How many pests have been eliminated? And these smart guys, several of them raised their hand and made a goose egg. None. We have not eliminated one pest. But we've eliminated many, many, many uh, beneficial insects and spiders and predators of the, of the harmful insects and birds uh, and Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, etc., is part of that whole story. And so it's time we woke up and started getting a possible future for nature as well as for ourselves in stopping all the spray stuff. Another painting of a bird I did, sitting on top of a balsam tree, and me being a naturalist and a teacher, I'm always trying to indoctrinate. Uh, balsam trees have, are one of the few coniferous trees whose cone, cones point up. But this is the balsam in Ontario. And that's a Cape May warbler, for those that are curious. And I hope you're all curious, but I doubt it. Uh, you know that the average kid can name a thousand different corporate logos, but don't know the names of ten neighbors of other species, like the trees and the birds and stuff around them. Uh, I'm sure that you, you kids are different. Um, okay, now the story behind this is uh, one of my best buddies, he's a PhD in forestry, um, he, he's had his whole life in uh, Sault Ste. Marie at the Forest Research Lab there for the Ontario government. And he's maybe the foremost expert in the world on spruce trees. And he proved through his research, if you spray for spruce budworm, you will doom the spruce to commercial uh, un unviability. Because spruce budworm, it's getting a little biological here, I guess Rick, yeah, Rick is probably following, maybe some of you are. Because spruce budworm prefer to eat balsam. Balsam is a junk tree. Spruce is one of the best commercial trees in Canada, one of the best commercial trees in the world. So you spray for spruce budworm, you allow the balsam to come along, and it represses the spruce, and you get a junk tree instead of a beautiful spruce forest. So the best plan is to not spray at all. So I said to my buddy, his name is Al Gordon, Dr. Al Gordon, so uh, that's great news. I hope you tell the Globe and Mail. He says, no way, uh-uh. If, if I ever breathed a word of my research, my career would be finished because the politicians and the upper bureaucrats would have ways to destroy my entire life work because they love the spray program. I said, how come they love the spray program? Well, you have to imagine, it's budgets. And I, I've got this theory, little boys like to play with little toys and big boys like to play with big toys. Uh, to me, the biggest toys, boys playing with the biggest toys in the world is the Pentagon. And if they go wham, bam, whistle, that's even better. And then if you blow everything up and you have to buy more stuff, that's even better. Boy, boys love toys. And, and I'm a boy and I love toys too. I, I don't have as many toys as the average boy. But, uh, and so, uh, so you're sitting up there in northern Ontario listening to the spruce budworm chomp. And suddenly you get a budget for a spray program. Well, in come the float planes. And I thought I ordered 10 choppers. Where's them choppers? And I asked for six mobile homes. We need some more mobile homes. And it's budgets, it's money flowing in, and the, and the cafes in the community love it, and everybody loves it in the north. So you dare not try to get rid of the spray program because they all love it, even though it's taxpayers' money, even though it's useless, and even though it's killing birds and beneficial insects. And they just muzzle the scientists so they can't speak. And this is, I, I couldn't believe, you know, coming along, I was not, never a scientist, but half of my friends are scientists. I didn't have them, any genes for math, so I, I went into geography. My, by, the, by the way, my degree's in geography, not art. I didn't think you have to take art. I'd always knew, I was a group of seven groupie, and I took geography so I could get free field work in the summer because I wanted to paint in the wilderness like Tom Thompson and, and those guys. Anyway, most of my friends are scientists, and, and they've been telling me, this is getting worse. Scientists are not allowed to speak. And the more right-wing the government, the less the scientists are allowed to speak. And out there, and some of you uh, grown-ups and maybe some of you kids can think of wonderful scientists with fabulous life work, uh, and they've been fired. They've been got rid of, and if they're around, they've been muzzled and punished for speaking out. What we badly need are good whistleblower laws and transparency so we know what's going on and, and hire these scientists. We, we lost 1,600 Parks Canada people about two or three weeks ago. <laughs> Wonderful people. Um, so these are the kinds of things we need to be paying attention to. 
and we need to pay attention. I've already said we, we need to do one thing we have to pay for, a good future. The other thing we have to pay attention and not amuse ourselves to death all the time. Uh, this is another one of my paintings, an ostrich in Israel. Israel has ostriches. In fact, Israel is the best country in the world, I think, for protecting nature. Every Israeli military officer must be a trained naturalist, believe it or not. You, you hear all this bad news from Israel, but there's good news. Every Israeli military airport has military ornithologists. They've reintroduced every animal mentioned in the Bible in Israel living wild and free, except for lions, for obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but they've got leopards, and they've got wolves living wild and free in Israel. Bob and Birgit Bateman saw our first Canis lupus, gray wolf, in, in the wild in Israel, not Canada. We've seen uh, quite a few in Canada since then. So anyway, here's an ostrich, and I just use this to, to say this myth. Uh, people say ostriches bury their head in the sand when danger threatens. Wrong. Ostriches lower their head because they're kind of a sitting duck with hyenas and lions around, uh, but they, they keep their eyes wide open. And that's what uh, so many powers that be don't want us to do. They don't want us to pay attention, so they muzzle scientists. And they, they get, uh, like all those newspapers up in northern Ontario that wouldn't ask me those questions, those newspapers are all owned by the logging companies. So they don't want to know. I mean, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. And so uh, uh, this, is my, this is where I'm going to make some of you mad. W one of my own particular bugbears, being a realist painter, I actually have contempt for fantasy. And I think, I think fantasy, uh, I, I had complete contempt all along for Star Trek. I guess you're too young to know what I'm talking about with Star Trek. To me, it was just plain silly and uh, about as interesting sets as a dentist office. <laughs> and total silliness. I think most, most fantasy stuff is completely silly. I know a lot of people disagree with me. I'm, I'm interested in re reality and realism. I'll, I'll, I'll make a quote, and I, I haven't said this before in a talk, and maybe uh, Rick and Elizabeth haven't heard this quote before. It is, um, small minds are fascinated by the extraordinary. Great minds are fascinated by the ordinary. And that's true. All little kids, every little kid, especially boys, love dinosaurs. And, and I'm interested in dinosaurs too. It's, it's normal. Small minds are fascinated by the extraordinary. But, but some kids, and, and kids are encouraged to never grow up and still keep being fascinated by all this weird, you know, what is it with aliens? What is it with vamp this whole vampire twilight stuff? <laughs> Sorry, I don't get it. <laughs> I know I'm offending a lot of you. I think it's really dumb. <laughs> and, and I think we should be dealing with real nature and real human nature, reality. So uh, this is what's happened. Neil Postman wrote a, wrote a book back in the 80s and it's been reissued called Amusing Ourselves to Death, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business. Because of man's almost infinite appetite for distraction, electronic media is turning all public life, education, religion, politics, and journalism into entertainment. George Orwell wrote 1984. Boy, that, those, that's before you were born. And that was the future when George, he wrote it in 1949. And Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World in 1931, the year after I was born. Orwell feared that truth would be concealed from us Huxley feared that truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. I think, well, I think both are happening, but I think this Huxley was more right. Orwell said that people would be controlled by the infliction of pain. Huxley believed that people would be controlled by the infliction of pleasure. I think in both cases, Huxley is more uh, true to the point. And one thinks about back on the decline of the Roman Empire with the bread and circuses keeping the public amused so they didn't really know what was going on. It's happening. Uh, this is something I've been just very recently uh, been getting into and giving a lot of thought about, about uh, dopamine and how we're all hardwired for this. Now, no matter what kind of creature you are, whether you're a herring or a human, we're all hardwired for evolutionary reasons to get dopamine rewards for the three things so we can, so we can uh, not go extinct. First of all is nourishment. Uh, that leads to greed and gluttony and obesity. But uh, if, in order to, you'll die if you don't have nourishment, whether you're a minnow or a human being or whatever you are. 
Now, it isn't exactly uh, normal. Uh, it's kind of a disgusting thought. If I'm going to put it this way. Sorry, you haven't had lunch yet, but it's so. What is nourishment? Nourishment is you take dead plants and dead animals and poke them in a hole in one end, and it goes through and out a hole in the other end. It's a disgusting thought. However, we get this dopamine, which is the pleasure hormone in the brain, saying, wow, this is fabulous. It's a Big Mac. It's a chocolate shake. Or make, in my case, any ice cream or cashew nuts. We get a huge dopamine reward, and we get a bigger dopamine reward the more fat it is and the more sugar it is. Because when you're out hunting and gathering, you, for the minimum amount of effort, you want to get the maximum amount of impact. Well, nowadays, we don't have to go out and hunt and gather. You can get fat and sugar stuff real cheap in abundance. And so it, it's, I'm suggesting maybe we ought to show some self-control and say when, uh, when it comes to this, because it's so easily available. Reproduction, uh, don't need to tell you about another word for it is sex. Um, and that, of course, can lead to lust, to pornography, and all kinds of things there. And I could, I could talk on and on about that. Uh, the, that category has led to practically whole wars. It's led to murders. It's led to all kinds of abuse. Um, all kinds of stuff goes on when it's carried to extreme. But if it wasn't carried on at all, we'd go extinct. And so, t sorry, I'm getting disgusting again. My wife says, don't talk, don't say this in your talks. But anyway, it isn't sort of a, a natural thing to have two strange human beings who look different from each other come together, get really close and intimate. It could be dangerous. Uh, however, you get a, a big dopamine reward, especially if you're an opposite sex and you're a breeding age, you get a huge dopamine reward for it. And it is uh, very, very much to be encouraged. Uh, because we get a lot of pleasure from it. There's a little side story which I also maybe shouldn't tell. Uh, <laughs> I have to, have to uh, think about this. Uh, if a, uh, I don't know how you measure dopamine. Uh, I've been uh, trying to correspond with Dr. Gabor Mate, who works in Vancouver East Side, uh, and he, dopamine is the kind of thing he talks about. Um, but let's say a really, really, really romantic kiss. Now, I hope the adults in this room can all think of a really romantic kiss, and maybe some of the young people can. I can think of three, but I'm not going to go into details in my life that are very, very memorable among the, the hundreds of thousands. Um, <laughs> but the, let's say a really romantic kiss gives you a dopamine reward of 100. Now, here's what I maybe shouldn't say. I was told when I said this that crack cocaine and ecstasy can give you 1,500. So a Big Mac and a chocolate shake or a really romantic kiss will give you 100. These recreational drugs, it's just off the chart. There's only one catch because there's no free lunch. If your dopamine receptors get so overstimulated, it closes them down. So the only way you can have pleasure again is to hit the crack cocaine again. And then that won't do it. It has to be a little bit more or they close down. So those that want to dabble into that area are guaranteeing they will not be happy again with ordinary life. Just forget it. It's over. You have closed your dopamine receptors. Uh, anyway, maybe some of you have tried it or want to try it or whatever. So that's that one category. Uh, protection. This mainly ap applies to the guys because all through most evolutionary history, whether you're a lion or whatever you are, a sea lion, or an elk, it's the males combining dopamine and testosterone to have fun going into battle. It really is fun. So you're a young guy in a cave, and the, if the cave bear decides to come back. So all the teenage cave boys grab their spears, and they go out and they really massacre the cave bear. Or the enemy is coming over the hill, and they're going to rape all the women and kidnap all the children. And so you chop the enemy to bits. Yes! Is that ever fun? <laughs> that is just great. Well, nowadays we don't have that many cave bears or enemies coming over the hill that we can chop to bits, although the Taliban do. And, and you put a warm gun in, the, in those young guy, unemployed guys' hands, it's the same thing. They, get, they do it for fun. They say they do it for Allah, but I, th I think they basically do it for fun. Same with gangs in uh, Los Angeles or New York or whatever. It's fun to have a warm gun. 
Did, do you remember the expressions on the faces of watched TV after the Stanley Cup riots last year? Those guys were having fun. S smashing windows and so on. That was a lot of fun. So it's kind of a male thing, although I think some girls get off in, in this way. But uh, n nowadays, um, a, whole, a whole host, of, and it's an increasing thing, of guys, they have fun from blowing people up and smashing them and shooting them and mowing them down with little things. And all you have to do, only exercise you get is you have to just move your thumbs. And so you can play violent video games instead. And you get that, that violence dopamine effect. And all of these things are exploited. All of those three human vices are exploited by the guys that are making tons of bucks, getting kids to do what they want and spend their money, do what those guys want them to do. And they're, they're, they're really picking all the low-hanging fruit and hitting the easy buttons. If human vices are systematically cultivated, it will inevitably lead to nothing short of the collapse of intelligence. And in this society we have, I think they're systematically being cultivated. And I think you'd have to agree. I don't know if you've heard of the marshmallow test. Some of you might have heard of it. Um, back about 40 or 50 years ago, some psychologists tried this. It's, it's, it's kind of a mean test. They got four-year-old kids, put them in a room, put a marshmallow in front of them, and said, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to be leaving the room for a few minutes. I'm not sure how long. If you don't eat the marshmallow, when I come back, I'll give you two. If you do eat it, well, you've eaten the marshmallow, and, and that's it. And so they then observed them through these, one of these windows, and the kids were going through agony. <laughs> some of them were licking it and putting it, some took a bite out of it on the bottom of it and put it back down again. <laughs> others ate it right away. Others were able to last for 15 minutes or so, which is a struggle for a four-year-old kid. But the interesting thing is they followed those same individuals up 40 years later. And without fail, the ones who showed self-restraint and resisted had six more successful lives, they had better jobs, they had more successful marriages, and raised more successful families. And the ones who completely failed were losers. It's, it's quite shocking. The self, what, I guess you can get what I'm getting at. All those dopamine things are being shoved down your throat. Self-restraint is a good idea. And by the way, self-restraint can be taught. That's one thing the, the psychologist found out. Now, as you can tell, I've, I'm interested in, in young people, kids, if you like. I've got five of my own, and I taught high school for 20 years. That's me as a high school teacher. And <clears throat> I started teaching, the first year I started teaching was 1955, which was the beginning of television, more or less. Uh, some homes had TV. It was all black and white, obviously, and uh, some didn't. That was the first year, uh, I bet nobody in this room would have been around to remember that. The first year that Elvis Presley was on the Ed Sullivan Show. By the way, believe it or not, back in those days, the whole family watched the same television show. I mean, that's, that's really a wild thought, <laughs> but that's what it was. On Sunday night, everybody sat and watched The Wonderful World of Disney, Marlon Perkins' Wild Kingdom, and the Ed Sullivan Show. And Elvis Presley was on, of course, showing him only from the waist up. It was way too dirty to show Elvis Presley below the waist, so. They didn't show that part on TV. And the next uh, day, of course, it was Sunday night. Next day, Monday morning, the, especially the girl, well, not the guys didn't care, but the girls were going crazy. You could hardly contain them in class, especially the grade 10 girls. And they were really flipping out. By the way, girls used to be that way over, uh, maybe, are you still that way over Justin Bieber? I'm not too sure. <laughs> I probably not. Anyway, this is a room full of sensible people. Well, they, 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 they really were flipping out. Uh, and this one girl said, you know, I was rolling on the floor, the, the living room floor, and squealing and screaming, and my father was telling me to get up, get up. I, I, and oh, wasn't he fabulous, sir? I, I said, who? I knew who she was talking about. Oh, oh, Elvis, he was just so fabulous. I said, listen, in another five or 10 years, you will have never heard of Elvis Presley again. <laughs> so now you know you can believe every word I say. Uh, and so uh, during that time, I, and, and because I'm a geographer, and well, that was 1955. So since 1955, I've been not just bird watching, I've been kid watching and watching things happen. And this is a drawing of, of teenagers at the school where I taught, drawn by one of our students with a ballpoint pen. Ballpoint pen is my weapon of choice for drawing. And so just while you look at it, I, I observed a new species being invented. They're called Homo sapiens teenager consumerensis. 
and the species was being trained uh, to consume stuff. And you had to create them as a special species so that they felt different from the rest of mankind. So you, f uh, you train them for special foods, special drinks, especially special music that adults couldn't stand. And this was all done very consciously using a top psychologist to train the kids to be this way and make them feel that they were rebels. And special clothing and so on. And then you change the styles, uh, you know, two or three times a year so they had to buy all new stuff. And um, then when you get the teenagers really rolling, you try to convince the eight-year-olds they're teenagers already. It's happening. And then when you get that really rolling, you try to convince the 35-year-olds they're still teenagers. And so for the first time in the history of this fantastic species we have here, this two-legged creature called Homo sapiens, the most vital time of life, we'll say between the age of 10 and 30, they have one main role in society, and that role is to be self-indulgent. That's the main role. They, sorry, by the way, I'm not talking about any of you. Um, when, I'm, when I'm talking this way, I'm not referring to you kids because uh, kids are all different and you kids are self-selected or somehow selected as, as being not the run of the mill. But it, it is happening and it's been growing and growing. I, I thought it might, be, might get, uh-uh. It's got more in those 50 years or so that I've been watching it go on. And so here we are today. Uh, this is maybe the saddest picture I'll show all day. Um, I have no idea who this kid is. He's, uh, watch it. He's a, uh, I don't know, he's in, it was in a news, Newsweek magazine article. And uh, I'm not sure if he's playing a video game or watching TV. Uh, Chances are he's playing a video game on TV. Actually, I don't know controls that well. Um, but there was a, a cartoon in the New Yorker about this species. And by the way, this seems to be an increasing species. They're not people in this room, but they're an increasing species, getting more and more. Um, okay, I see the hand going up. Uh, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to make it, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to press on and try to talk faster. <laughs> uh, there was a cartoon in the New Yorker a couple of years ago. It's two young boys sitting on a stoop. One young boy says to the other. What are you going to be if you grow up? If you grow up. This is the first generation in history where children may die before their parents do because of this lifestyle. The average North American kid spends seven and a half hours a day, every day, seven days a week, looking at a screen. How much time do they spend out in nature? None. And that's the first, until, from the beginning of human history until 15 years ago, kids always played around out in nature. That's another whole talk, which I, I have to really rush now. Now, by the way, as I said, I'm not referring to you kids. Uh, and there are some incredible kids. There's more terrific kids out there than, than I've ever seen in history, I've ever known about in history. Uh, and here are just three examples. Um, this is uh, Simon Jackson. Uh, at, he, when he, he was uh, 14 years old, he heard about the spirit bear. That's another one of my paintings needing protecting, and he formed an organization. He got rock stars and movie stars and so on active. That's what he looks like now. Uh, uh, Elena Podmoro um, heard about the plight of girls in Afghanistan not being able to go to school, and she started an organization called Little Women uh, for Little Women. That's what she looks like now. That's what she looked like when she started, just a young kid, 12 years old. And this kid, Mark Kilberger, heard about the, the kids in India who are forced to uh, make carpets instead of go to school, and now he and his brother have formed this uh, Me to We organization. So, <clears throat> where do I think we should go? Um, I'm warning you, Hillary, I'm going over a little bit, but I'm rushing. Um, uh, this is Schumacher, who I mentioned earlier, Small is Beautiful. This is his, uh, his Holy Trinity, and it's quite a, I'm going to talk about possibilities for the future now. It's it's quite astonishing to say what we should be aiming for is health, beauty, and permanence. Permanence? Well, that goes against those guys in that red car with the rose-colored glasses going up the road. And it says we've got to say when. We should be looking for a way to be. And I had a, a glimpse of this. By the way, I was just over in England and Holland uh, for the last, uh, well, for 10 days last week, last couple of weeks. And I think the, the Europeans are 
are way ahead of us in many ways, and some of you may know that, but many of you don't. Birgit and I and, and our two boys lived in Germany for a year, so our, our kids could learn to speak German before they were 12, which was kind of a deal they had with their grandfather, because uh, Birgit was born in Germany. And this is the house we lived in. We lived in a little farmhouse cluster. Our next door neighbor lived in an old mill that he'd renovated and, and had converted to electricity, and he sold the power back to the grid. I don't know if we can do that in, in BC yet or not. Um, and um, he was an abstract artist who never sold his art, but he, what he did, he designed water slides for theme parks. And we had a fax, but it was before email then, it was in the 87, 88. Uh, we had a fax machine and he was faxing George Lucas in Hollywood. He was working on a theme park with him. And the, another neighbor here was a cluster of three, had um, a widow and 10 daughters and they were dairy farmers. So we all lived together in a little farm cluster. And look at the countryside, full of forests, full of nature, and full of very good farmland. This is a map. That's where we lived, our little farmhouse cluster. Uh, that Amarang was a 1,200-year-old little village. That's where we had our bank and post office and did a little grocery shopping. And you can see all the forests in the countryside, all the roads. You could jump on your mountain bike and ride through private property, through farm and village and forest. There was never a no trespassing sign, all open to the public. I never saw a no trespassing sign once. You can just go anywhere. Uh, because they, try, they don't have a lot of idiots who are going to throw litter and stuff around over there. So we'll now go a quick visit to Amarang, our little town. This is a pizzeria, but all the buildings had to be built in the typ typical Bavarian style. We're in Bavaria in southern Germany. There's a, uh, a cri uh, I mean, a Mercedes coming out of the parking lot. By the way, they used to say, uh, how do you tell a rich German farmer from a poor German farmer? Well, the, the the poor German farmer has to wash his Mercedes himself. The rich German farmer can pay somebody to wash his Mercedes. In fact, we saw all kinds of Mercedes at farms. They subsidize family farms there. In Canada, we subsidize agribusiness, the big farms that are killing family farms. Um, and that's a trout stream flowing right through the village. There are towns and villages all over that area with trout streams with trout in them, crystal clear trout streams. I'm looking, and now I'm gonna look across the road it's a backyard across the road, right in the middle of town. The bank is one, is about four places away. There's a pony. There's a kid's playground on swings. There's a little, uh, there's a little garden there for the family garden. A great big barn here where the animals go at night. From the, they walk into town from the fields. This is uh, something you may not have heard of. It's called a solar-powered clothes dryer. You take clothes and you hang them on a line, and, and the, the the wind and the sun dries them. It's a pretty wild and weird advanced concept, but that's what they're doing there. And the background is a very sophisticated computer center. They have the latest 21st century stuff. Well, and then it was 20th century stuff. And I, I'm gonna skip this. I've got tons of things to say about the Little Valley in Austria, but I have to skip it for sake of uh, time. But this is a harmonious valley. They, they do their logging continually, and they've planned the logging for the next 200 years. And they've got a little furniture factory down here that uses the wood locally, et cetera, et cetera. It's abundant with wildlife and so on, but I'm rushing. So um, what do I think our future would be? Should be small is beautiful. This is the book by Schumacher. Economics is a people mattered. And I think there's good news on the horizon because I think we are gonna get smaller. And you guys will live to see it. It's gonna be exciting and a little bit different this is why your world, it's a cover of a book, why your world is about to get a whole lot smaller, a whole lot smaller, by Jeff Rubin, Oil and the End of Globalization, and he's just come out with a new book. I heard him on the CBC yesterday being interviewed. He's promoting the new book called The End of Growth. Uh, I heard Eric talking about how we're gonna grow, grow, grow all our hydro. Well, maybe not. Maybe we're seeing the end of growth. And another guy, who maybe probably doesn't even know Jeff Rubin, an Englishman, wrote the transition handbook from oil dependency to local resilience, Rob Hopkins, the founder of the transition movement. And in it he has a graph, this is the age of oil, in a graph, okay? Uh, there's the year zero, that's the time of Christ, the way we date things. The year 4000 down here, in the middle is the year 2000. Okay, this is very interesting. Uh, around 1900 was the start of the age of oil. That's when my mother was born, 1900. My mother was born in a middle-class family in Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. 
uh, and they had the first Model T in town, so they weren't poor, but she grew up in a world that was thousands of years old. They cooked on a flame, they, they lit with a flame at night, they traveled on foot or by horse or by wind or rowing or whatever. And that had gone on for thousands of years. My same mother, I only ever had one, uh, saw a man walk on the moon. Can you imagine? From horse and buggy and, and age of sail, seeing a guy walk on the moon, sort of halfway up that point. And we're at the top now. And Jeff Rubin has a theory. We've, we've, there's a lot, there will always be lots of oil, but it'll get so expensive, we won't be able to travel. And so we're at the end of of cheap oil, we're at the peak of cheap oil. And it's gonna go, do nothing but go up and up and up and up from now on. And it, it won't be uh, rules and regulations that change things, it'll be capitalism. And by the way, I'm a capitalist, I believe in capitalism and I, and I, I think we need rules and regulations, however. And so the theory according to Jeff Rubin is, my grandkids' lives, and I've got grandkids your age, will be more like my grandparents' lives than like our lives right now. We're living in a very unusual and special time at the top of the peak age of oil. And going down will not be quite as much fun as it's been going up, but it'll be a way better. Be better for nature, be better for communities. You'll be able to go to stores in Canada and see made in Canada on the shelves, believe it or not. I mean, it's pretty far-fetched, but this is the prediction if Jeff Rubin is right. I've sent away for his new book, The End of Progress, and this is the theory, this is what is coming up. So we are going to have a smaller world. So in conclusion, people sometimes say, don't you worry a lot about the future of the planet and worry a lot about pollution and all. I have, uh, honestly, I've never lost one wink of sleep over it. It's stupid to worry. I, I, I like what Mark Twain, if you're a teenager, you're probably worrying. When I was a teenager, I worried all the time. Uh, it gets better as you get older. I think you worry less and less and less. Uh, Mark Twain said, you know, some of the worst things in my life never happened. <laughs> so why waste a whole lot of energy worrying about stuff that's probably not going to happen anyway? And most of the stuff we worry about is never going to happen. So that's me standing there not worrying and just, just kind of looking at nature, taking three deep breaths. If I had more time, I would have you sit there and do a three-breath meditation. But I don't think I've got three seconds to do a three-breath meditation, so I'll go on to a First Nations quick legend. Uh, this is another one of my paintings, the Rufus Hummingbird, looking out our bedroom window in a Douglas fir. Uh, there, the, the legend, the First Nations legend is, uh, there was a forest fire, and all the animals were running around in circles. They, they couldn't figure out what to do. So this hummingbird came along, and it saw the fire, and it saw a little puddle, and it went down and got a drop of water out of the puddle and flew over to the fire and dropped the water on the fire. And all the other animals said, well, that is really stupid. That is pathetic. Uh, what do you expect that to do? Uh, and the hummingbird says, well, maybe it'll do some good. Maybe it won't. But it's something I can do, and so I'm going to do it. And from that legend, I'll go to a great conservative philosopher of the 18th century, Edmund Burke. No one made a greater mistake than he who did nothing because he could do only a little. And another First Nations quote, Chief Seattle, he evidently said, man did not weave the web of life, man is but a strand in the web of life. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. All things are connected. And finally, you know this would be the last slide, this is the most fantastic piece of real estate in the universe, way better than anything on starboard boards with all due respect or any of those fantasy things. It is just great. Uh, and it can be great in your grandchildren's time, and we only have to do two things. We have to pay attention, and we have to pay for it. And I think it's worth it, and I'll close to quote the great 20th century philosopher by the name of John Lennon. Some may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. Thank you.